like to talk a little bit about the, the CubeSat standard and um, how that's really kind of a revolutionary technology for spacecraft development. Um, the thing that made spacecraft so difficult, so expensive to design in the past was that um, each sort of platform was unique. Um, there it was very difficult to, to um, manage the complexity because there were a lot of, of options and alternatives and you know, spacecraft very expensive to develop. So what the CubeSat standard does is it sets an envelope, uh, a specific shape and size. Um, and this is an example here, about a four inch cube for um, the envelope for the entire spacecraft. Now that's actually quite a challenge to put all of the functionality that you need in a spacecraft into this much space. That's all the power, all the communications, the com computer to, to manage the mission, the payload. Um, but what this, what this form factor did was it provided a standard interface for the launch vehicle. So now this the P pod that Cal Poly developed could be mounted to a rocket, and it was a well-known form factor, it was a well-known mounting system. So that could be designed independent of what sort of satellites were going on inside. And then uh, the P-Pod could accommodate 1U CubeSats like this. This is effectively 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. You go 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 20, or 10 by 10 by 30, and have a, have a complete satellite about this big. Um, and, and, and having that that interface where you could mount the P-Pod and the launch provider could provide that interface to hold the P-Pod on their launch vehicle and then the CubeSat developer could go to develop their CubeSat and then plug it into the, to the P-Pod really was a revolutionary change for spacecraft development and uh, accelerated the, the development of small spacecraft. You know, we started in, in 2006 with Kentucky Sat as kind of as our focus and we were actually calling ourselves the Kentucky Sat. Uh, consortium or Kentucky Sat um, program, and then we broadened into Kentucky Space pretty quickly. Uh, launch opportunities are uh, very hard to come by. Uh, orbital opportunities, so we started looking at uh, suborbital opportunities and uh, high altitude balloons, and uh, really kind of changed the scope a little bit to Kentucky Space. And the goal of Kentucky Space is to provide the um, infrastructure. Uh, physical infrastructure like the clean room here, um, uh, manpower infrastructure in terms of the students going through the pipeline able to design spacecraft and, and subsystems and put them all together, do all the systems engineering and all those sorts of things, integration for launch, and you know maybe even uh, get to the point where we're spinning off high-tech companies, small companies from the effort in the state. So kind of the whole package of developing the infrastructure to, to have a space program in Kentucky, hence the, the name Kentucky Space. Big part, a big component of the program is um, outreach and, uh, and, and the pipeline from K through 12 all the way up through undergraduates, graduate students, faculty learning how to, to build space systems. And uh, we've been very active uh, with uh, you know, half a dozen major missions, lots of firsts that we've achieved, and it, it all really started with, with KYSAT-1 as that kind of that um, initial idea. That's still our flagship mission, but we've really uh, branched off and are doing all sorts of interesting things along with that. Despite the small size, CubeSats actually have all the major uh, subsystems and components that you'll see in the larger satellites, um, such as command and data handling. On KYSAT-1, we're using an MSP-430, which is a microcontroller out of uh, Texas Instruments, and that handles all the, all the all the other subsystems on the satellite, and it also interprets the commands that we send up and then executes them. Uh, moving up, we actually have two different radio systems. Uh, we have a, a UHF VHF uh, amateur band radio, um, and then we also have a higher frequency 2.4 gigahertz and also higher data rate uh, S band radio. Our primary radio is the UHF VHF, and the S band is kind of a semi experimental. Um, trying to you know kind of get the higher data rates um, in these small packages that will make them more useful um, for science data. Um, the other subsystem we have is an electrical power system uh, that takes 
um, power that's generated by the solar panels that are on the outside of KYSAT-1 and converts those in, converts that into usable power which is stored in a pair of uh, lithium polymer batteries that I have on board and also distributed uh, throughout the system in a regulated fashion in order to uh, run all the different um, components. And finally we have a uh, payload interface module. It's a custom board that in interfaces uh, the payload of the satellite. And the payload of the satellite is pretty much just um, a camera. The, the purpose of KYSET-1 is to do educational outreach and um, with that one of the highest impact things that you can that you can do is actually you know, visually see what's going on up there. So uh, KYSET-1 actually has the ability with its radio to interpret um, DTMF commands which are the tones you hear on an old touch tone phone that's called DTMF and that can actually uh, hear those and interpret them and then actually take a picture. Um, and then also with its high powered amateur band radio um, the students will actually be able to listen to the satellite as it comes across. And so uh, one of the things that we have to do in order for this educational outreach idea to work is develop uh, some ground software and some uh, graphical user interfaces in order for people to use them. So that's what we're in the process of doing right now, is actually developing these um, different user interfaces that we can, def that we can um, deliver to different um, users. You know, there can be more of a power user type and then also a more basic one for, for the beginning teacher or the beginning student. Um, and so KYSET-1 has, has an operational lifetime of, of five years. Uh, we're planning here at Kentucky Space, we're planning to do active um, control and active research with it for about two years. And then after that, we're going to turn on something called digipeding mode in which um, other amateur radio operators um, can actually send up packets and even if it's not a proper KYSET-1 command it will recognize that it's not a proper KYSET-1 command and then just reflect the, um, the packet that was sent up back down so you can actually use it as a communication tool over very uh, long distances. It's called cross-band repeating um, so it would be uh, going up to the satellites in VHF and then coming back down from the satellite in UHF. So it's called cross-band repeater. And uh, again, for the last three years of its of its uh, lifetime, before the batteries go out, those, that's going to be the first to fail. Um, it'll be acting as a cross-band repeater. For the first two years, it'll be uh, an educational tool as well as a research tool for us to learn more about um, the satellite in general. We are um, really starting to look at finishing up our plans and, and designs for the outreach components and the operation of KYSAT-1 where we'll try to make it available to uh, K-12 through students throughout the state uh, through web interfaces um, where they can command the satellite to take pictures at certain points in the orbit or they can send audio messages up, get, get telemetry data back down in terms of temperatures and voltages and, and things on the, the satellite and then um, there are modes where students can actually just go out in the playground with a with a fairly inexpensive handheld ham radio and a, and a handheld antenna and you know with a little information from the internet on when the uh, satellite will be passing over and where they can get out and actually listen to it and, and send commands up to it themselves so um, we're ramping those efforts up as well and that's going to be uh, exciting for all of us to, to see the satellite launch and then actually get out and, and see the, the kids faces when they uh, realize there's a satellite passing over developed here in Kentucky and uh, they can talk to it. So, so for the future, we really do have a pretty uh, generic structure for um, taking the bus, which uh, again is the the non-payload stuff in a satellite, the structure, power systems, communications, kind of control processor, commanding. Um, we have a generic bus that we can attach to a variety of payloads, and it's it's um, fairly well structured the way we did it with a with a payload interface module, which is really the only thing that would have to change, and then we could stack another payload on top of our basic KYSAT-1 bus. And we've looked at uh, several concept satellites of, of taking that bus and leveraging it. Um, we have some other proposals in right now that kind of, to kind of leverage that bus to build other satellites. So we're hoping to, to in, indeed do a series of satellites. Um, you know, we're going to evolve the bus, we have to, but we have that basic structure and that basic way of, of, of doing things and the commanding that uh, we hope to, to uh, leverage for several satellites in the future. Mm -hmm.